Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we're bringing you day 666 of Russian war with Ukraine. That day, Alexei spent uh, with an interview with Yulia Latina. They have not talked for a while, but this one turned out to be interesting, as usual. So, before we dive in, special thanks to our members. Today, thank you goes to Vadim Cherdak, PSH, and Enhill. Thank you so much for supporting our channel. It matters. It definitely helps us to continue working and translating these materials for a wider audience. Also, our quite traditional thanks goes to Bill. Thank you for super thanks. Much appreciated. And with this, let's deep dive into day 666. Take a listen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Yulia Latin and Alexei Rostovich. Hello, Alexei. Very nice to see you. Good evening, Yulia. Please do not forget to subscribe to Alexei's channel if you haven't done that yet. The links, of course, are under this video. Of course, do not forget Yulia's channel and clicking likes and share buttons. And if you haven't subscribed to Privateer Station, please don't forget to do that and click the like as well. So I have one question before we go to strategic matters. Zelensky had another press conference and he mentioned recently that he is about to draft another 450,000 people to the army. And the way he packaged it uh, was rather interesting for me, because uh, military uh, warfighters, they are definitely in, in Ukraine waiting for rotation, waiting for reserve to replenish them while they rest. But it turned out, it seems like, from the presidential speech, that it's military who are responsible for rotation and mobilization. And that's my first question. Why was his message structured so strangely? And I also want to rewind to a year ago, when it seemed that after Putin's mobilization, people are starting to leave Russia. And it seemed that Russia is on the failing curve, while Ukraine actually had lines of people waiting to get to the front to fight the aggressor. And now in Russia, they generally gather 30, 40,000 troops per month. And in Ukraine, people are running away from mobilization. And now we see Zelensky. First of all, he is not taking responsibility on his shoulders for that. And then second to the question of when the rotation will happen, he kind of readdressed and dodged this question towards the military. Can you explain what's happening? Well, in my opinion, somebody did a poor job consulting Zelensky because defense of Ukraine is fully responsibility of Ministry of, of Cabinet of Ministers. And Ministry of Defense is only one of those entities that comprise Cabinet of Ministers. And he did mention that Minister of Defense will be also involved. Um, actually, they will be rather involved. Um, but if somebody consulted him properly, he would have addressed it to the Cabinet of Ministers to the head of it, Shmagal, Denis Shmagal. Second, still the final actor who approves everything is President himself. So who is the subject? The subject is the one who is ready to bear responsibility for his actions. And when you see these actions to move responsibility from oneself to military and also not according to the law because to the law that should be Denis Magal and cabinet of ministers so then it means that somebody ill-prepared president to answer this question then that somebody also doesn't know the law of ukraine for the second year of a big war and 10th year of a war with russia and this is sad that this team out of five or six men the president was talking about, the closest aides to him, his managers, that somebody is so ill-informed or doesn't have enough knowledge. And third is that president trying to dodge responsibility, saying that it's a military question. So he is stealing his own subjectness by doing that. So whoever consulted him to answer this way really served him bad. Apologies, Alexei, then I'll ask what surprised me exactly. Because these two years were, which is usual for war, 
were followed with the concentration of power in the hands of Zelensky, which is very uncharacteristic for Ukraine to give so much power to president. And power took responsibility initially for everything. They were saying, I, I, we. And when it came to problematic issues, the power is dodging it. And instead of sending all support to military, and basically, I said it many times, he should have put Zaluzhny on a pedestal and essentially addressed the nation to make sure that if Zaluzhny says jump, you jump. So here, instead, in the question that is supposed to be resolved by civil part of government, he is now walking away and saying, well, that's not mine. Okay, first of all, Julia, um, war, quoting Churchill here, is too serious to let military solely run it. Military know how to fight the fight, but all machine behind it, the government, the economy, and there are many other sides of apparatus, they just need to work to make sure that the whole system runs and there are enough resources to fight the war. Because it, there are a lot of other matters. There is economy, there is uh, health issues. There is only maybe a couple ministers in the government that are, I mean, maybe a couple more from the enforcement agencies that are that have some relation to the military, right? And the rest are generally from the civil service. But cabinet of ministers needs to find, and that's why cabinet of ministers is responsible, because military are a minority there. That's why it should foster a discussion, it should foster a general strategy. And that's why mobilization is not a question for military. That's why it is the cabinet of ministers. It's a done purpose. Now, as for the matters, it is unrealistic to bring half a million war fighters, new half a million, to the front. This is a very unrealistic number, and I don't know where it came from. And if it came from military, then I am of a strong opinion that they're trolling president. Because if they really gave that number, that basically is uh, trolling because they're giving numbers to the cabinet of ministers and to Zelensky that are unexecutable. And that is uh, very reminiscent of a story with 17 million artillery shells that I heard on the American side and 400 billion or 500 billion of support, monetary support. If it is so, then military side of the problem is trolling the other, saying that um, we cannot resolve the problem militarily. That needs to be a solution, political solution to that. And if you don't understand, we'll be giving you these numbers. The numbers that you sooner or later maybe will understand that it's impossible to achieve your goals by trying to get to these numbers. Second, imagine, okay, we found 400,000 men and dumped them into the trenches. The president didn't answer the question, is it total that we need or is it just the amount we need for rotation? So let's imagine that it's not half a million from the economy to the military, that this half a million will indeed foster rotation of the other half a million. So my question then, how good of economic agents would the soldiers be who come back from the front? Right, they'll be rather poor. Exactly. They're not about economy. They'll be probably taking three, four months to come back to their senses, to psychologically unwind, to stop waking up at night, screaming, to stop ducking when they hear a boom or a loud noise. So they'll be very poor economic actors. And everybody will need some psychological help. So in this case, it means that it's about a million of active participants of economic relations will be totally away from economy, taken out. That, uh, in my view, would mean uh, a collapse of Ukrainian economy, which is rather poor as is. Plus, the ways that uh, they conduct this mobilization, that fashion is also directing that economy to collapse. Because gyms, restaurants, resorts, trade centers, all these facilities are starting to empty up in Ukraine. And we've seen some stats already that in uh, many parts of Ukraine, in Zakarpatia, uh, there are a lot of cancellations of Christmas celebrations because people are afraid of the draft. 
And now there is another news that they are throwing uh, mobile drafts points on the roads in the Kiev region. That means that uh, guys will stop hiding or will, will stop uh, driving. They'll keep hiding. So the roads will be also empty. And then the other question that one should pose, why people are dodging the draft? And that's probably the main question. Let's come from afar. How long has Ukraine been in existence as an independent state? How long? Oh, no. How many? How many Ukrainians exist? Mm. Alexei, do you mind not going too far away from my question? How everybody were waiting for Putin to face certain collapse, but it's happening in Ukraine instead. And now in Ukraine, you are basically putting it in parallel to Donbass, where Putin was drafting everybody from even under the sofas. No, 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 I'm not dodging, Yulia. I'm actually diving smack deep into that. How many United States futures or kinds of United States exist now? At least two. No, actually, I would say at least four. Republicans, isolationists, Democrats, globalists, Musk was here with his third way, and the deep America that doesn't care as long as it is not touched. And if you count additional forces that are represented, then you should also add ultra-left and ultra-right. There is a reason why they're shooting a movie, Civil War, a sci-fi drama and a political thriller. And have you watched the trailer? Do you know the questions they ask there? I posted it in my Telegram and then Twitter. So there a patrol stops a family on the road and the family is appealing, saying, wait, wait, what are you doing? We're Americans. And they're asking them, what kind of Americans are you? They're saying, well, we are natural Americans. And the patrol says, okay, let's, uh, in orderly fashion, show us whom you read on Twitter. And uh, how many kinds of Europe exist? How many kinds of Russia exist? I would say probably three, very roughly, three big Russias. One is anti-war, another is pro-war, and the third is that doesn't care. Right, okay. At least. So in every country, there are different variants, different scenarios being played out simultaneously. Now, let's go back to Ukraine. On the 24th of August, 1991, they started as poly-ethnic and polycultural country. And then, due to different reasons, some part of Ukrainian people decided to start with a mono-ethnic and monocultural experiment. And the... For the most success would be a ferry on with your statements, but you get my message. So when you try to convert polycultural, polyethnical to monocultural and monoethnical, I wouldn't even say Russian speaking, I would say all other citizens of this country that speak different languages and belonging to different cultures, regional, national, ethnic, political, whatever. They become citizens, they become second grade citizens in such a country. And that happens automatically, regardless of how crystal pure and noble are those people who are trying to build the mono-ethnic state and the monocultural state. Everybody else becomes second-grade citizens. Now a question. Second-grade citizens, do they want to fight for the country where they are second-grade? Well... The citizens of the first grade are also not wanting to fight for it, right? I see a lot of people who are saying, my trench is Facebook. They're very strongly against those Russian pig dogs, but they don't want to fight against them on the front. They'd rather move to Europe, and over there they would be fighting with all their might and will be screaming and calling names and saying about genetic slaves and will be tearing Ukrainian shirt on their chest and will be calling to do the fundraiser for military and then they would say, we've done everything we could, but something on the front is not working. And this is the second stage, right, that I wanted to address. You just jumped a little further, but yeah, let's unwrap it. So, people who are standing in lines to the drafting points for the first six months, they're already on the front. There is a small group that are still volunteering to certain brigades, like 3rd Storm Brigade. Those are motivated. The rest, there are not tens of thousands, right? And the rest of society don't even want to. 
And in Russia, they steadily get 30, 40,000 monthly. So what it means? It means that Russian leadership found a motivation. It's a simple one, it's mostly financial and some propaganda. And on our side, financial motivation was pretty good. 120,000 was a generally good salary, especially for the depth, for the non-city population. But people still want, do not want to fight for that. And then ideological motivation also doesn't bring tens of thousands of people or half a million that the president announced in his speech and his press conference. So now we are grabbing people by force on the street, pulling them to the military service, and people are saying we don't want to. And military also saying we don't want these soldiers because they refuse to fight when they're all already in the trench. That means that the previous motivation, whatever we had, is depleted. That we need to change the system of motivation. And in Ukraine, is there a single sign, maybe you've seen Yulia, to attempt to change the system of motivation in Ukraine? Well, Alexei, I'm looking first at Putin. I'm thinking the main force that is uh, conducting this war is Putin and his government. And we will discuss Putin's intentions and actions. And the second place where my attention mostly is, is Europe. So activity or lack thereof of the West. And I'm trying to understand for myself what role internal role in these events is being played by disconnection and quarrels in the Ukrainian society and how much they do affect the other processes. So I don't know what to start with, but I will start with a story that really impressed me from Israel, where in Janin, several soldiers after a military operation, there was real fight going on, but after that, several of them ran to the mosque, found the as expected in Janine, a big pile, stockpile of weapons. And one of the soldiers came up to the minaret and uh, read into the loudspeaker one of the Jewish prayers. So now these soldiers will be court-martialed for misbehaving for these acts. But um, they actually didn't even swear, they didn't even cuss from the minaret. They read the Jewish prayer. And for now, they've been punished. And if you don't know how they've been punished, they've been removed from participating in military activities. So their pals are fighting and they're punished sitting on the backup bench. So I have a question. Why the army of Israel in the cruel war that started with a massacre, with a genocidal massacre, is fighting this way and treats the enemy this way? Well, because Israelis know who they are. That's coming back to the topics of ethos, pathos and logos. Where is the ethos coming from? When you know who you are, and not on the level of political constructs or propaganda, but deep inside you feel who you are. When you feel who you are, you have your place in the world, you have your ethics, you know what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. Israel has it. It has some nuance, but generally Israelites are not people who would be desecrating foreign and other people's sites. So, and this is not supported in any fashion. The reaction to that was immediate. In many other countries, people wouldn't even consider that to be a crime. So you read, you read a prayer, big deal, right? You didn't scream pig dogs, you didn't scream genetic garbage, you, or looking at Hamas, you didn't rape didn't burn people, didn't cut their breasts off and didn't play soccer with them, weren't uh, baking their children in ovens. You just prayed on your native tongue. And the reaction of just, justice is fast. And they also had another one. There was a joke in there, these tunnels, the Hamas tunnels, they're like bug tunnels in Robert Heinlein's and Starship Troopers, and that they're fighting against the bugs and Israelites are the Starship Troopers. That joke was also stopped immediately, because dehumanization of your enemy is forbidden. And they understand that they're fighting with humans. It is difficult at times to call them humans uh, after what they've done, but they should not be equalized to bugs. So this is the tactics and this is the moral state of Israel Defense Forces.
Now, as for us, as for Ukrainians, we don't know who we are. We know that we live in the country of prohibitions, where the freedoms are being suppressed, and in the country where people are being captured by force and drafted by force and thrown to the front. Who wants to die for that country? Zero, right? Alexei, well, in this stage of war, this is um, pushed by Putin. That whole situation indeed is uh, enforced by Putin onto Ukraine, and Ukraine needs that uh, cannon fodder in the trenches. It doesn't need that many special services people, but it needs people on the front to defend the front line, who, somebody who would be able to sit in the drenched and uh, muddy trench where the meat and hopefully just the rat meat is floating in the puddles and you cannot really get out of the trench for the fear of drone hitting you. And this is exactly the trench story of 1916 and it's very difficult to offer anything else. And Putin found with his money, with his special military forces to push his uh, recruits into the trenches. And despite of little protests by the wives of mobilized, he doesn't have big uh, protests in his society against it. So somehow Putin figured a way to wage this war when we were afraid that a year ago or thinking that his society will blow up. It didn't. And now we have in Ukraine a situation where society might blow up with all the difficulties they're facing. So the question is, Yulia, then, why didn't we give Putin, make Putin fight a different war than he wants to? And I think you are devaluating de the number of soldiers on his side that are actually fighting not for money and not because they're fearing to be executed. There is a big swath of them who go for fight for propaganda that they heard, who go fight for the big holy Russia the way they see. Right, because money, you won't be risking your life daily for the money they're being paid to that degree. And any force, military force that will push you in the trench, you can shoot back at them. So don't primitivize that. Russian society and Russian relations, they are more complex and they're successful at least in numbers. And we failed on our side in this regard. In our Telegram channels, there are interesting polls going around. So even in the media, they would stop somebody on the street and ask, hey, so what do you say about Russian-speaking Ukrainians? And people very often would say, well, yeah, it's bad, it shouldn't be here, Russian language is not right. And then the second question is, how do you treat Russian language soldiers? Oh, then the answer changes. While they're fighting for us, then it's okay. So what does Russian-speaking Ukrainian hear through all that that is about to be drafted? Yeah, that he'll be fighting for his own second greatness, right? Alexei. Exactly. And Alexei, more than that, he's looking for a reason to not be drafted, to not be mobilized. And I would also say the West is looking for an excuse to not give aid to Ukraine. And here Ukraine volunteers. Yeah, you put it right. He is being offered to go and die for his second greatness, to reaffirm that. And he doesn't want to do that. Then he is trying to use his money from his card that he made, that he earned, honestly. And then suddenly he discovers that banks stopped him from using certain money, numbers of money from his card because Getman's of politics and all limits now how much Ukrainians can spend and where. So this is difficult, right? Now he faces difficulties there on the financial side. Then he's trying to move his wife and children to Europe and he faces a lot more obstacles there. Then when he is trying to watch some alternative viewpoint on TV, he can't. There is only a single TV mar marathon on all channels. Do you think a person, after seeing all that, will volunteer to go and die for that regime? For what? All right, then look how it started. Let's look back how it started. At the beginning of war, Ukrainians were calling Russians and heard back that, wait, wait, just wait, we'll just uh, take care of the Nazis and we'll liberate you. And people were thinking, how on earth could some propaganda take so much root in somebody's minds? And there was a big tempting uh, option to think that 
people in Russia are somewhat wicked and dysfunctional to believe propaganda that much. But then we, what happened in the last year and a half, we see that, for example, Hamas slaughtering Jews and then Palestinians jumping around for joy and saying, well, this was great, and then it didn't even happen. Then we see another a very strange uh, thing in United States, a young generation walking with slogans, queers for Palestine. So even without Putin's TV, they managed to shit so much in their brains without any Hamas school or anything, they somehow auto propagandize themselves and now have very fantastic views on what's happening in life and in the world at large. And now we're seeing what's happening in Ukraine after what you were saying exactly, that power is reinforces certain positions. People are not coming with that voluntarily. It's power and the system that reinforces such a viewpoint. And my question is, does it help the front to the front? Because in my opinion, all these ideologies, they prevent soldiers from fighting professionally. But they do consolidate society either around civilian powers, not the ones who are fighting in the trenches, but the ones uh, who are Right, the, the society that will pay money to not serve and the society that will bring it on the banner and say, well, see, I cast our enemies this way. And Russia, they have the same thing. There are people cursing Ukrainians and all the names they can find. And from the Ukrainian side, there is a similar figure who wants to feel himself a hero, but he is too afraid to risk dying on the front. So the same Z uh, followers in Russia and uh, the same situation in Ukraine who are calling Russians genetic slaves. It's like fighting with global warming, I think. When a human has an instinct to fight, and on the other hand, a human has an instinct to fight in a safe mode, to do it safely. And that really affects the waging of real war, I think. So, Yulia, our forces, our political uh, forces in power, they made a bet on monocultural country. And Zelensky at a certain time promised to build a different one. He actually got 70 plus percent of votes for him because he promised to build a different country. And any drafting commission arresting people on the street and bringing them to the trench, they basically should be asking them, are you ready to die for monoethnic and monocultural Ukraine? If no, he shouldn't be drafted, he shouldn't be put in the bus, shouldn't be brought to the front. Finally, they should only be there the ones uh, who want mono-ethnic and monocultural Ukraine. Those should be fighting. If you are declaring that you are proponent of certain values, you should be ready to die for them, right? That would be on honest. So some Russians are saying we are for the great Russia, we're ready to kill and die for that. And they're going and dying en masse. Well, not everybody, Alexei. I think you're idealizing the Z uh, followers in Russia. Those who are saying they don't die, those who die, they don't say. Well, let's not argue in detail on that. I know what's happening among the troops on the front, on the Russian side. I did study that. You are talking about the necessity to think complex and primitivizing your enemy and not doing that. But in essence, you just did that. So some people are like that, others are different. It's complex. In Ukraine, some people are ready to go and die for the country, others don't. And in the shape the current project is suggested, the current country is out outlined, they can only draft so much, and the rest need to be brought by force. And then a big chunk of those that were brought to the front, they will mutiny over there in the trenches. In every detachment, we have from 30 to 70 percent refusers, as we call them, the ones who refuse to fight. So we also face about a brigade leaving the front monthly and a whole year you probably have 12 brigades that run, right? So people, my point is people will not be dying for the project of a country that they don't like, the one where they don't want to live. That's why sociological polling is showing that you can take my passport, I don't want to be a Ukrainian if that resolves you hunting me down for the trench, warfare. 
and the other point I want to make is that when the country decided to become a mono-ethnic project, they automatically refused from the borders of we, that we had in 1991, because the borders of 91 are the borders of polyethnical and polycultural state. Odessa, Kharkov, Lugansk, Donetsk, Zaporozhye, Dnieper. These are all polyethnical, polycultural Ukraine, with the majority of Russian-speaking and Russian culture, background, ethnos. So when they were told that they are citizens of a second grade, they started thinking, why do they need all that story? And that's why those people who wholeheartedly want mono-ethnic Ukraine to happen, they might actually get their wish. God sometimes grants their wishes. It might happen, but it probably will be in the framework of nine Western districts cut away from the sea and with big issues of doing any cargo activity on Dnieper because on the other bank there'll be Russian troops. But even for the Western Ukraine, they're not eager to die. They want to die in Canada, in Facebook, in the United States, but not on the front, many of them. Those who are teaching people how to live, how to speak the right Ukrainian, how to use the right culture, the rest don't need that. They don't need Ukraine in this structure. What is the adherence to ideas, uh, how do you define that? It is measured by, are you ready to fight and die for that, to kill for that and to die for that? So for a project like this, for a mono-ethnic country, there should be the ones who support that, they should be the ones fighting in the trench. The ones who don't agree with this, they shouldn't be, right? Fighting for being forever second-grade citizens and be kindly Ukrainized, are they masochists? Why would they need that? And now we have political leadership that is lying to us, looking in our eyes and lying, with spittle and all covering the front rows, and that's happening either by design or by lack thereof, and just not even realizing that. Because when you're building mono-ethnic and monocultural country, it will never be able to stay in the borders of a polycultural country. So. When we hear from our government the borders of 91, they're technically not possible in the project they're peddling. And when you're saying, yes, we're building monocultural country, but to the borders of 91, all that part of Ukraine, which is polycultural and polyethnical, they would. They understand that that means that there'll be a monocultural Ukraine taking over and they automatically will be degraded as citizens. Tectonic changes of a landscape where they live in radical changes of their lives. For example, in Odessa, when they wanted to remove Pushkin monument, which actually was crowdfunded by citizens. And it doesn't add their loyalty to that monocultural state. They don't want to, they don't want to defend that idea. And they want to stay away from anything mono. And people feel that. Also, they feel that uh, global lie that is coming from the top pulpit in the country, that they're being told they're second-grade citizens. If though there are some citizens who want to fight for mono-ethnic, many of them also don't want to fight for the economic situation that we have, because it's rather flawed. And okay, there are, might be somebody who wants to fight for that project and the economy the way it is, they don't want to fight for limiting their political freedom, right? So you filter down the pool of people who can fight for you. And they always can bring issues that they have with their country, the population at large, right? Political aspects that some of the leaders are not being let out of the country borders, and the economic reasons and the other. And what do you want them to go and be volunteers and trenches? What do you want from them? And what we see in Zelensky's conference is that this problem is not recognized. It is even beyond the cognition limit of people who are conducting this press conference. And the power is going to act by a principle of golden hammer. So they'll be using that hammer till it breaks at its base because it worked before, so now they keep doing it. The situation has changed radically. When I was still a student, I was taught on the second uh, class of the tactics I was taught that 
the basic thing you can do is be adequate to the current situation. That's the bare minimum, without which you, you'll just lose. And the actions of Ukraine right now are very drastically different from the demands of the situation. And the result of not being able to mobilize and draft people to fight this war is stemming from this. But then they cannot stop them from leaving their detachments on the front or just refusing. People are wise. People refuse to fight intuitively for the country that they don't like and the order that is now being implemented in Ukraine. And now add our stupid propaganda that dehumanizes the enemy and also dehumanizes self because dehumanization is always spitting in the mirror. When you dehumanize somebody, you automatically dehumanize yourself. That's why Israelis not, do not allow that. They don't want to dehumanize themselves. And that's it. And here's the lid of the coffin that can be put on top of the country and nailed down. There is very difficult exit out of this situation. And the only way is changing the type of the country we are fighting for. If somebody comes out and says, OK, guys, we've lost. We played a little bit in the mono project, but it's going to be a bad one for us. We figured we'll probably have only a third of a country left at the end of it. We'll lose access to sea. We'll lose two thirds of our territory. We'll be a small, funny piece left of Ukraine. And inside of that little remnant, we'll probably be fighting and squabbling as well. And if we don't want to go and fight for this project, then and the society at large is saying, yeah, we don't, then we need to decide what are we going to build and how what we are about to announce to our population. So the people will say, oh, okay, this is mine. I do like that. I'm ready to risk my life for this. I'm ready to kill and die for this. Because I do like this version of a country, if not for myself, then for my kids and grandkids. For that, I'm ready to. So that's what needs to be suggested. Somebody in power needs to come out and say, this is the project of the country that would be appealing to the people at large to stand behind the machinery, to work two shifts, to fight in the trench, to die, to risk your life, to kill. Better game formulated this issue. He said before forcing people to die in all these winter wars, you first need to build a country that you want to defend. And he was saying that after the political issues they had in Finland. Maybe you know Yulia, but our viewers maybe might not be aware. In Finland, it was not so smooth as well. And the country they've built, they're building now, is the country Ukrainians don't want to fight and die in mass for. This is already a fact, period. Um, the main question then that I have is the intention of Putin in this situation, because everything you are saying during the last month or two, it's almost that Putin, you're describing what Putin is betting for. Because I'm thinking he's planning an offensive, but I'd probably ask you first, what do you think he's planning? But I suspect that right now Putin and his strategy, if I was in his place, let's put it this way, way, then uh, there is a strategy that he follows. The biggest point of strain seems like is happening in Ukraine. Everybody initially thought that it will explode in Russia. Usually the country that suffers the defeat is the country where it bursts. So I think Putin is now betting on something in Ukraine to happen, like in Germany in 1918 or in Russia in 1917, when the society refused to participate in war. And maybe there are other strategies about actual fighting war. And we understand that during war, inner changes are a very dangerous thing. And he is guiding his society with a steamroller to prevent any of these changes. But these are my considerations, and I'm curious to hear your ideas, because despite what you're saying, that a lot is connected with inner setup of Ukraine society, I think one of the main factors is uh, still Putin's invasion, and second is that he had won the summer round. No, I don't think this is the main factor. Defeat always demotivates. No, Yulia, Putin is not the main factor. The main factor is our inability to answer the question who we are and what are we building. And to provide an answer that would satisfy 
most of our society without squabbles, inner wars and the rest. I brought up America as an example for a reason. Also Russia, China, Israel. Israel also has issues answering who they are. Remember before the war they had hundreds of thousands of people demonstrating on strikes in Israel. And I think the whole humanity is now in that area. And we can record a whole stream about that as a separate topic. Oh, absolutely. Right. So Putin is not the one defining all that, but he figured one interesting thing. It actually is uh, learned in their genes since Mongols. If you are hitting the same spot for 300 years, you will achieve your result. This always worked. And this is what Russia and Putin is demonstrating now, the thing that is called long will. And this war with Ukraine, in a weird paradoxical way, started to get Russia healthier. Instead of killing it, it actually started to revive it. The economy, yeah. Not only economy, Yulia. They also became more logical and more reasonable. You can observe that on their military forces. Now they're organized better, they're being planned better, they're being used better than at the beginning of this war. Moreover, when Russian army decided to use one of the NATO templates at the beginning and conduct a military police operation, they all perished here. All the elite troops, all the cadre military of Russia were destroyed within the first six months, and the plan of invasion suffered utter defeat. After that, they made very painful steps that were required, and they started rebuilding their system and bringing back the Soviet system. And suddenly it became much uh, more effective for them when they started getting some results, and it became much more difficult for us to fight that. And we are also in a similar position that we need to make certain painful decisions, but they have, we need to acknowledge, made them earlier and moved further down the road. So the other question is, what does he want, right? We don't have an answer. That's a good question. And many groups are probably will providing different answers, because if he wants to physically consume Ukraine, this is one story, then he has to keep fighting new fronts, new hundreds of thousands of people, pushing them forward, and maybe by 2028, 2029, they'll get to Lvov or to Zhitomir. If he wants to have a friendly state, or at least a non-enemy state on his borders, then it's a different thing. He does not need to capture the country, because uh, in this case, if you do capture, you basically create an eternal enemy out of uh, certain parts of the society. And he would have fixed uh, the status of anti-Russia on the Ukraine for dozens of years. So in order to avoid that, to not cre create an anti-Russia on its borders, he needs to withdraw. He needs to give back Zaporozhye, Kherson, and withdraw at least to the borders of February. And maybe suggest a different thing, a different treaty that we would never be hostile to each other and never attack each other. This is a different option, and we are not sure what exactly does he want, but in the recent press conference he made very interesting statements, and we can address those. First of all, he was making statements on the background of Ukrainian flag, and some of the correspondents were wearing the colors of Ukrainian flag, as if randomly, right? Blue and yellow. Second, what did he say? He said that, I sincerely regret the war ongoing between Russia and Ukraine, because it is a war between two brotherly nations. Oh, these are crocodile tears. Right, but regardless, we are analyzing what he said. This is a war of brother against brother. It's essentially a civil war in its certain fashion. And he said he deeply regrets it, because Ukrainians are brothers. So what model does it hint to? It's not just hinting us to the second model, but if I may to add something personally here, yes, then what he was suggesting in Gomel and Istanbul, and what he is suggesting now at the press conference. This is Ukraine, that is a satellite of Russia, that is not a part of the West, that is demilitarized. The army is 120,000 people, which is not a part of NATO. And we'll see what will happen 100 years later, but in his uh, short term, these are his demands, or appear to be. I think he has two strategies. One maximum strategy is in everything that was in Istanbul and what he is suggesting now. And if it doesn't work, then 
to weaken Ukraine to a maximum level, that it would not be presenting any danger to, to, to Russia and keep biting pieces of it so they would become part of his military machine and create more horror in Ukraine so people would be leaving the country continuously, weakening it. So basically, he's offering Ukraine this variant. You're either staying a relatively big country, but then you'll be in my orbit, you'll be my satellite, and I will figure things out. I'll bite a piece here, I'll make your people run otherwise, if you don't behave. And he's winking at Poland so strongly, uh, because that's part of his ideology. He thinks that Poland would want to bite pieces of Ukraine, and if Poland decided to, he would be absolutely happy. But he's definitely winking towards Poland and making signs. And yeah, it just outlines his two versions. Ukraine will be whole, but under me, or I'll tear it apart. Okay, so whole in the orbit of Russian Federation, a satellite of Putin not joining NATO or EU, right? That's his project. Clear. Now, which project does our power suggest, our leadership suggest? Mighty Ukraine in the borders of 1991 joined EU, joined NATO, and monocultural and mono-ethnic. Now, let's ask which project has more reality behind it. I actually always had this question, Alexei. I forgot to ask it before, when they say the borders of 1991. It never was followed with an appeal to citizens of Crimea or Donbass, especially Donbass, because this is probably a glaring example, when his own, their own government just abandoned people there. It's not people who crossed to Putin's country. It's the government who abandoned their own people and decided not to pull them out. After that, they became hostages. After that, in 2022, they were plucked and plundered for territorial defense, so-called, of Donbass. And Ukrainian government, instead of calling them back to Ukraine, because we want the borders of 91, Ukraine took a position, we'll court-martial you when we catch you. So how are they going to come back to 1991 with this approach? And who will give arms in the West for this approach as well? Yulia, what can they turn to the citizens of Donbass and Crimea with? Well, they can appeal with uh, democracy, no? Right, they, right now our government can come to them and say, we, you'll get a lot of bonuses if you join us. First, we'll forbid you to speak your mother tongue. Second, we'll grant you the opportunity to study Ukrainian, and you'll be using it everywhere. Third, you'll become a part of a system that will be abusing your financially for the, for the poor and for the rich as well. There'll be a lot of checks and inspectors and everything like on Ukraine proper. Poor ones will be paying all the taxes and the rich ones will be paying bribes. And you need to immediately turn your arms against Putin and join Ukraine because it's such an honor and delight to get a tax inspector, a fire inspector, Ukraine security services and other control organs that will come and ask you to provide them certain kind of financing. This is so much better than what you have now. Oh yeah, that's exactly the same thing, right? What Putin is doing there. Right. Except for over right now, it's being taken away from them in their native tongue, and Ukraine suggests them taking it away in Ukrainian tongue and you becoming a second great citizen. So that's the main difference. And what do you think main part of people will select, will choose in this model? Then I have another question, even more scary question. I will not name the name of the field commander, but I think the story is rather well known that I heard that back in 2014, maybe 15, but I think it was 14, when one of these bigger field commanders was going to switch sides and to join Ukraine and already lined up his fighters to go to Ukraine, then they basically told him from the Ukrainian side, if he wants to come to Ukraine, he needs to surrender as a prisoner and to take responsibility for everything he had done. And that's when I thought this war was conducted not for territories, it was conducted for the minds and souls of people in there. Any big country, any big uh, empire or country, it 
appears not because it eliminated surrounding tribes and nations, but because it incorporated them. If Ukraine figured a way to let this commander come back with his troops and do it systemically with others, they could have returned Donbass to themselves. Right, so we can summarize it here, saying that Ukraine has nothing to offer to Donbass citizens except for converting them into second-tier citizens. Problem of Ukraine that it cannot even offer anything to its own citizens in its current state, besides separating them into first and second tier. And right now, poor ones are in a bad position. They don't want to fight for the system that was milking them for 32 years, that was hitting them with uh, bureaucratic vehicles on the cross uh, road crossings and not carrying any responsibility for that, beating them up in the police departments, taxing them to an umpteenth degree and putting them in jail if they don't. Oh, you're describing Russia, Alexei? No, no, it's Ukraine. It seems like such a mirror. So people with resources, they don't want to go fight as well because the system really milks them in a very blatant way. And they understand that if Ukraine wins now, we'll have success on the front. In a paradoxical way, in the face of its current leadership, it will preserve the current leadership. And do you know what it means? It means that more and more Ukrainians are not interested in any success on the battlefront. And they're showing it with their feet by leaving the country and going abroad, by evading the drafts commissions. Do you know if that will continue for a while when the passive ways to defend their lives will be up and they'll start knocking on the doors and getting people from under the sofas? Somebody will start shooting at these uh, draftsmen. Oh yeah, I think Putin is actually hoping for that, right? That's when the passive defense from the government will switch to an active defense from it. And a question, now we have two Ukraines. One is absolutely fictitious, where we join NATO and the EU, and in the borders of 1991. And in order to maintain that, the leadership is abusing its own citizens, tightening all the bolts, taking away their dignity and milking them for money and other resources. This Ukraine can't even exist technically. And another option, Putin's satellite, small, without an army, but peaceful, not at war, and maybe even with cheap gas. So which one will win sooner or later? Oh, like Georgia under Vanishvili, right? We have an example, exactly, where people don't speak Russian at all, but their politics are absolutely pro-Russian, and Georgia is turning into Russian satellite more and more. This is the strategy he already used. This is a known strategy to him and tried and, and actually rather successful. So which one do you think will prevail and what is the exit? The exit would be to suggest a third kind of Ukraine, better than the first and better than the second, the one that would actually appeal to Ukrainian people, the one that would inspire them to actually fight for it, to spend their lives and efforts to build it. And this is my plan. So how does it look like? And how is it going to fight Putin? So this is a free, poly-ethnic, polycultural country where, of course, the state language is Ukrainian, but you can use any other language without limits, where people are not punished for their opinions, where they have freedom of speech, a truly free country with free economy, with the guarantees from the government that nobody from the government will come bribing and racketeering the business the country where people would want to remain and let their kids grow in, the country that has a long history that goes back to Knyaz Yaroslav Mudry and Vladimir the Saint, um, dukes, the famous dukes of those times, when uh, they were fathers-in-law to have the king's uh, families in Europe, and not to the current state when we are depending on Hungary, not even the whole Hungary, but on one party in Hungary that is now begging for money. The country that returned its dignity of thousands of years. And to Putin, we need to come with a different offer. Let's strike a peace accord and we'll do it in a very special way. We'll put a collective bill towards the West, Russia and Ukraine, and we'll say an interesting thing. Alexei, I don't think the West owes us anything, neither Russia nor Ukraine. No, Yulia, listen me out. I think they do owe us. And we need to state that your attempt of the West to rely on the structures created in 1945 doesn't work. We need to build a new collective system of safety. 
that will account for real interests of all sides involved, and announcing the end of history and developing NATO towards Russia, creating a threat to its independence as it's understood in Russia. And the problem is that Russia is now going and ready to die for that, for defending their sovereignty, and NATO is not. And now we also have the backdrop of polling in the West, where in the States, 79% of youth under 30, not in Harvard, but general polling, are considering Jews and whites to be the oppressors. And the West that helped to disarm Ukraine, to take away Ukrainian nukes, the West that promised to give military aid and didn't, not in the enough quantities, and that still continues to supply Putin's industrial complex. 77 parts in his dagger Kinjal missiles are American-made. Alexei, yes, what? So, you just said that Ukraine is the country that many citizens do not want to fight for. And isn't it strange that you're also posting a question to the West that the West doesn't want to provide arms to Ukraine because you're kind of running in the same problem, not even going deep into short-term decisions made by the West collectively. Can I talk maybe for 30 seconds here, just put some thoughts out. When you said that Putin is playing long will, it is a very important thing. But the problem is that dictatorships now they have long will, and all democracies do not. They have very short-sighted strategies. They're only maximizing the number of likes at the current moment. And the whole politics of Ukraine can be described as the politics of maximizing likes. And this is not the problem of one country or one leader. It's the problem of the whole West, modern countries in the West. The West was actually making decisions to support Ukraine in the same fashion. That same Boris Johnson, who came to talk Ukraine into making sure that you do not surrender because his butt was on fire because of the COVID and other scandals, and I'm exaggerating here a bit, but still to draw a picture, that for his own political gains and goals, he so actively jumped into supporting Ukraine to distract his voters. Right, that's exactly what I think they can and should answer for. This is a collective bill. I was participating in Istanbul negotiation group. Those golden terms that were offered to us back then, we are not going to say again, I think. Who was the person who cancelled Istanbul agreements? Who were those forces who promised support and failed to deliver? Who did not fulfill the Budapest memorandum, first pushed us into that agreement and then failed to deliver on this? So I heard also the, besides Johnson, they called Biden. I don't know who, who called whom, but I can say that Budapest Memorandum was not fulfilled by Britain, United States and China as guarantors. We were disarmed and we were pushed to deliver our missiles and nukes to Russia. And these missiles are now falling on our heads, those X-555, same exact missiles. Arms that are being used on us have a lot of American components. A vessel from Novorossiysk, a military base of Russia, left it and came to Norfolk naval base and brought 50,000 tons of some cargo, we don't know what. That great tanker fleet continues to move and nothing is happening with it. And many, many other things. That's what they have to respond for, collectively. So the best thing we can do is pause the war and say, hey, let's regroup. Let's see what happened in real life since 1991 and who owes whom what. That's one of the exits. That would be a jump behind the flags that nobody is expecting for it. Do you think Putin will pause it? It depends what he wants. If he wants to continue fighting with Ukraine, then he needs to see that perspective that he will not get any neutral or friendly state if he continues, and he will probably have a very small, uh, much smaller Ukraine, maybe just on the right bank, but the country that will hate Russia with a burning passion of a thousand suns and will be doing anything they can to hurt Russia. Is that what you want? Plus, you'll also waste uh, 
thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, and maybe will face more sanctions, weak as they are, but you still, do you really want that? Till you get to Dnieper. So this is also a question about what future Russia does he see, does he want, and post-Soviet space, and space in Europe. And I want to say that none of these schemes work. We need to invent something absolutely new, something that did not exist before. And these negotiations, however you call them, Viennese or Westfalen, and it can last for four years or ten years until we figure out the security system, because alternative is endless war with death of thousands of people. And let it last, let us duke it out on the political field, but pause the war in the meantime. So we're talking about the Georgization of Ukraine. Well, that's on the other scale, right? We just agreed that one of his plans is basically what he was suggesting in Istanbul. And nobody agrees to that plan, Yulia. These are his methods. Georgization is essentially his way of fulfilling Russian one-sided interests, which were logical tools up until February of 20, 24th of February 2022. And it will not take us anywhere to try to do that in Ukraine or to urbanize Ukraine, just like Hungary, it won't quite work here. So we'll need to find a new solution. I will ask another question here. Do you think Russia, regardless of Putin or whoever else is in power, does Russia have national interests? Yeah, it does. And I want to say here, Alexei, that about a year ago, I thought that this war will be over with utter Putin's defeat to the borders of 1991. In relation to, by the way, what you were talking from the presidential office at that time. And on the one hand, I understood that you cannot demand the borders of 91 and at the same time saying that you're fighting with genetic garbage and uh, kicking them out from Crimea. And I'm thinking this is absolutely suicidal. You cannot bring such a program to the West and ask for arms and then be surprised that the West did not give you enough. This is in regards to bills and claims to the West. I'm thinking that if Putin disappears tomorrow, and since the power will be taken not by the Russian Democrats or the Liberals, it likely will be retained by the current political establishment, and it's probably going to be the better option at this moment than the other even darker option of revolution and some other powers taking over. And logically, negotiations would be talking about the current front line and demilitarization. And I am afraid that the West, when we take the Putin out of equation and we suggest, or Russia suggests such a border and such negotiation, the West might just jump for joy and say, let's sign it. All right, Yulia, tell me please, Soviet Union, was it ideologically different from Russian Empire? Very. I think it was very different. And I think we are on a path where we can finally get to a discussion that it was too bad that Soviet Union fell apart, because I think it was a bad thing that it did. Okay, Yulia, I have a question still. How different were they? I think they were different, because they executed the Tsar, and they were doing some other atrocities internally. And what about the external politics? Was it different towards its neighbors? Right, Alexei, they, they very differed in my point of view, internally, because Soviet Union was using nationalism as the way to expand itself. And on the other hand, Russian Empire was trying to homogenize the cultural space, like France, which uh, also had southern France, but they still managed to build one nation, despite that southern France was talking different language, and Britain talks uh, on Celtic language. So Soviet Union had a different approach. They wanted to take over the whole world that was on their insignia, on their symbols, right? So they approached it differently. They had those 15, and then there was even a 16th Republic, Karelo Finnish Republic, that was annulled later. So they were saying, we got 15 republics, and I'm a multinational country. I support local cultural elements. But then 
they were going to continue joining more republics to Paraguay that Victor Suvorov was talking about. And I think that was the landmine that it blew upon, in my view. Yulia, do you know there were two big games in Central Asia? Big game one was won by Britain, big game two was won by Bolsheviks. So why Brits and Soviet Union were playing the same game being so different? They had a big game there when Britain was fighting for Central Asia with Russian Empire and then with Soviet Union. And it's considered to be two games, big game one, big game two. First was won by Britain, second by Soviets. And why they were fighting that war for Afghanistan? Two different countries, Great Britain and Soviet Union. Well, British Empire didn't really care about Afghanistan, but it was a threat to India. And Soviet Union essentially wanted the Afghanistan because it was a threat to India. Right, because strategy is geography. And regardless who is there, Stalin, Nikolai, Peter the Great, Putin or anybody else, the interests would always be determining the strategy. And we can discard or pay attention to these realities. The West tried to discard that since 1991. You know, there was an author of a long telegram to Stalin, oh sorry, to Roosevelt, an American representative who was in Soviet Union, Canon, who sent a long, I think it was 1941, he sent a long, long telegram telling Americans how to deal with Russians. And he was actually a rather serious figure up until 2005, he was a conservative, and he was in the 90s vehemently opposing NATO's expansion to the East because the price for that will be a big war with Russia in which Russia will win. And he wrote that back in the 90s. And it is not some marginalized Aristovich, this is a guy who determined all American politics since the Second World War in 1991. His long telegram outlined that. And this all is happening because the countries are not, in my view, taking into consideration real interests of the countries. We did not take into consideration our real interests. Russia tried to be liked by the West and also did some interesting things. And now Russia painfully and horribly getting off that needle. And we are still on that needle. And we are being told by the West that, well, no, you won't get any support and we're not interested in you. Right, Alexei. And also they may have issues with how Ukraine is fighting. So that may be part of that. Yeah, and that too. And uh, I think we'll probably get $60 billion in February and pretty much will be abandoned after. And wouldn't it be better for us to return to understanding who we are, to bring back dignity and calculator to the table and start calculating our real national interests? We've been conducting all kinds of politics. We've been conducting pro-West politics and Russia is now strongly suggesting with its arms to kind of start conducting pro-Russian politics. And I'm suggesting to conduct pro-Ukrainian that considers Ukrainian interests, historical, national, spiritual. And this is my suggestion. This is what I'm bringing to the table. And strange as it sounds, I actually think we should not be part of the European Union. Because look at our immediate neighbor, Poland, who is actually supporting us, but then coming in the EU and saying, well, yeah, if we are taking Ukraine into EU, let's do it. Let's spread it out in the next 20 years so they don't kill our agriculture right off the bat. And I'm thinking, why do we even need that then? That's why Ukraine is no more. The old Ukraine is not there. Plus, monocultural, mono-ethnic project is also dead on arrival. And it was just a matter of time, whether it's Putin, Pupkin or Navalny, but somebody would come there on tanks and will ask all the questions. Because history, when you keep running away from it, it always chases you with a tank eventually. And perhaps not even Russia, but some other country. That, so that Ukraine is gone, it's dead. And now we're in a situation when, yeah, that old saying, let the dead bury their dead. We can only get out of it by suggesting a different Ukraine that will behave differently internally and externally with its neighbors. Close neighbors, more remote neighbors, Russia, Poland, European Union and United States. And start talking to them in full voice 
fighting for its interests with dignity and honor. And this attempt to still fight for the dead country when they try to recruit another half a million people to throw on the front, I think this is a very pricey attempt at reanimation. And with this new Ukraine, I think Putin will come to his senses and will agree, will actually come to agreement, especially if we bring that as a multilateral commission to create a collective system of security in Europe, or better the world, because alternative would be a new 30-year-old war in which the West will lose. The West has already lost it de facto, unless they radically, drastically change their ways, because currently that West and that old Ukraine they have lost. They are not capable of pulling this long protracted war. When polls, 15% according to their polls saying, yeah, we'll fight for our country. The rest are saying we'll go somewhere. This is moral bankruptcy. When the West hates itself and 79% of its youth are considering their white ancestors to be colonialists and evil, that's the loss. When the West declared the axis of evil, but then still finds ways to supply parts to Russian missiles that are being used at Ukraine, it's dead morally. And it, uh, yeah, it's gone. It just thinks it didn't die yet, but it is. The only exit out of this is a complete rebirth, actually both, Ukraine and West. And old Ukraine is gone. I think morally we've been crushed. And what's happening with economy, with mobilization and information politics, this is the crash of this project. It's dead. And I don't think it, you can reanimate that. Any attempt to continue doing that just increases the victims and the losses. And the only chance we have, I think, is to jump behind the flagpoles and create a new system and create something new that will work out for everybody. Alexei, do we have five more minutes? Because this was such a great speech and I still want to ask you a couple of things. One is what for, especially the last two years. I understand that we've been giving people hope, right? All of us. But why during the last two years we've been essentially leading that situation into this cul-de-sac, strategic dead end. How can you be asking for the borders of 91 and still be trying to build a mono-ethnic country and ask for the weapons and money from the West? That is looking at this Hungary on steroids and thinking, what the heck? I don't think this is a correct question, Julia. I think the correct question would be why 32 years, not two years? Because we've been independent and independently doing all that shenanigans for 32 years. And we've been draining down the toilet our future and our country. I have an answer to this question, but I do want to hear your answer for that. I think it's rather straightforward. In order to understand things, you should always check them for vitality and mortality. The real identification, the real idea is good when it adds vitality, right? The drive more life energy and desire to fight for it, right? So it's expansion in good, not physical border expansion, but more like art, scientific, cultural expansion, right? And then there is mortality. And it's not always war, but it's always reflected in corruption when these decaying mechanisms are killing the country. For all 32 years, Ukraine was conducting projects with high mortality. We can count on the fingers of one hand the projects with high vitality. All the rest of the time we were killing ourselves. There is no explanation to why we sold the biggest arms group in Ukraine. In 91, we had the biggest army standing in Ukraine, 2,100,000 people armed. Why did we win the war, Mishkov conflict, the first attempt to capture Crimea in 91, 93? Because we were strong. Why did we win Tuzla? Because in 2003, because our army was still strong. But in 2010, our army was already weak. It was stolen and taken apart and just drained down the toilet. So for 32 years, we've been destroying ourselves. And the project of mono-ethnic and monocultural Ukraine, in my view, is the main culprit of it. Attempt to build it. 
and attempt to find the new owner in the face of the West. This is the main thing that killed us. We're dead. New us can be born and gain certain successes, probably very exemplary successes, but in order to do that, we need to make a few hard decisions and cancel some of the courses stated. And by the way, it is probably true to the very great extent, speaking of Russia as well, or any post-Soviet country except for a few, maybe like Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan. I think one of the main reasons here is that I actually talked about before, and it's not only about post-Soviet countries, it's about the whole announced end of the history, when it seemed that modern democracy is actually rather weak. They can only take decisions that are okay in the short term. And then they're also propitiating the motions of uh, organizations who are trying to instill views that they've been hurt and everybody owes the money and other resources. And the situation when two nations were building an empire one cannot say Ukraine had a control set of shares, but at least it had a blocking set of shares, yeah, talking about Ukraine and Russia. Oh, no, Julia, don't even go there. I think actually Ukraine created that empire. Fyofan Prokopovich was the one who came up with this idea of a Russian empire. All right, let's not discuss how many shares which country had, but let's talk about the fact that one of the co-founders of an empire is coming out and saying that they're the victim of it. It's very difficult situation with a lot of um, falsities in there and you know it brings likes and that's the problem of uh, democracies these days well you if you've been we've been lying for 32 years it would be surprising if we wouldn't lie about history as well right and up until the february of 24 it was that course now we have a chance to change it the war is forcing us to and I think at large, uh, we're talking about the end of modern. This is how modern is coming to an end. It started with a 30-year war and it's finishing with a 30-year war. And um, I think we need to start with understanding who we are and starting to behave accordingly. Because it is not Aristovich and Latinina who brought that upon us, ourselves, right? It's society, it's the guys who fight with drafting commissions not willing to go into the bus to be taken to the front. It is our society who is resisting that. We're just voicing it, but it's people of the country who are finishing it. And uh, people who are insisting on the borders in the framework of 1991, but who still don't want to fight for that. They're so loud in the media, but then they run across the border, dress as women, and flee for the hills. They are the ones who brought that upon us as well. Then I have one more question, I think, an important one. So we're discussing Putin and trying to find rational elements in his behavior. And I'm thinking that if one can translate from this mad language that he's using to somewhat logical language and throw out all the things about Nazism and demilitarization, if to translate that into geopolitical language, then his motives are rather straightforward and clear. But I always have concerns that it's you and me, two intellectuals, trying to translate somebody, basically, so to say, find some rationality in proverbial Hitler, and he is untranslatable in reality. What if so? Well, Yulia, I'm observing him since 2001, professionally, systematically. In that time frame, he did not make any irrational move, in my estimation. This is also one of the big myths about Russia. Germans are considered to be the house of rationality, and externally, yeah, it seems so. Internally, they are very irrational, starting with German mystics and ending with German porn. And you can see that these people are being guided by a very serious and dark irrational. Russia is a complete opposite of that. Russia seems to be mysterious and weird and strange, and it's considered to be an antipode of Germany with a mysterious Russian soul and shit. But 
internal subconsciousness is very rational, is extremely rational. It is so rational that you can actually use it probably in the Paris Chamber of Weights and Measures. And Putin, as an expression of that collective subconsciousness, is also very rational. And I cannot name any irrational step that he made. They're very unethical, yes. So Navalny's disappearance and declaring Akunin, the writer, to be a terrorist. Yeah, in his framework, it's very rational. And by the way, we should also consider that there are several models being offered in Russia right now. His enforcement agencies are now off limits and they're actually gaining power. So now they're a concern to Putin's regime in themselves. And they're presenting a problem for Russia and for the future builder of Russia, be it Putin or New Russia or somebody else, will have to shorten their leashes. But there are other people. Russia is a universe too. It has different projects. There is uh, an anti-war project and there is a war project. So some people are putting Navalny in prison and then hiding him there. And Gref, who was talking on some economic forum, did, did you hear what he said? Oh, Gref is from some archaic times before the war. Yeah, no, he recently, the head of uh, Sberbank, the biggest bank in Russia, on the recent conference, he said that, and I'm translating from his speech to the actual language, that the government needs to stop oppressing its own people. We need to grow our economy, and we can't in the current state. So there are different Russias, different pathways, and they're trying to define which one do they want to have in 10 years and 20 years. These projects are fighting between each other. To my regret, Alexei, I think, actually, no regret. This will be a Russia that will not be a part of the West. Does it have to be the part of the West? Oh, this is a scary question that I thought I knew an answer to up until recently, and now I don't think I have the right answer. Because I see that in that new world, where conflicts are being solved by force, as we see in front of our eyes, and when territory and geography still matters, and ethnical belonging matters. And because the West is very prone to taking short-sighted decisions, countries with different organization, too bad when it's dictatorial countries, but we don't have other examples much, they start to have advantage. Julia, North Korea can make several hundred thousand artillery shells, perhaps not a million, maybe of a low quality, but several hundred thousand. Russia can produce one and a half millions at minimum during a year. The whole West cannot produce more than 400,000 a year, and they cannot restart their military industrial complex. They tried to do that in summer of 22, and they failed. They're done on the material level. This is the expression of their complete moral bankruptcy that they cannot produce enough shells for the war. Because for this, they need to change model, they need to stop being the West as it is now, and they'll have to rediscover themselves again. Because industrial capital is mostly concentrated on financial speculations now. And financial speculations, they don't imply drastic production changes. And they honestly tried for two years already, and still have failed. Not they didn't want to, not they don't care about Ukraine, that too, but they really tried. Germany, which took six months to restart production to start building shells for their own tanks. This is a sentence into the whole EU. And now a question, does Russia or Ukraine have to be part of that West? And this is the question I keep asking myself more and more. Look, European Union cannot do anything with single Orban. One party, not even a country because Hungary is split politically, is throwing sticks in the machine of long-term plans of two biggest organizations, European Union and NATO, and they can do nothing about it. Why do we want to be part of that organizations then? These people who cannot standardize electric outlets for 18 years already, what, are we, what have we forgotten to be part of that? Well, we perhaps would appreciate that they don't poison their political leaders and they don't throw them in jail? Well, I can ask you a few questions here too, Yulia. Where is President Kennedy? Well, Alexei, this is not right. 
I would say we should probably start with Trump, who is trying to be prohibited from participating in elections in Colorado. But this would not be proper as well, because it's not to that degree, and I think he'll still be participating. Well, right, but they're actually threatening Biden in Texas to take his name out from the voting poll, right? So there is some pushback. There is actually some life in their systems. Okay, right, but the problem is that United States are facing their own set of issues and they're filming movies about civil war and they need a lot of things to resolve. So we should be independent and self-reliant and be building our country with a calculator in hand. We should know our roots. We started to defend some left project, which is a complete fakery, and our propaganda is the expression of our philosophic impotency. Everything was built on pathos at the beginning, and it fell apart as the war continued. In Russia, with ethos, they don't really have anything there, but and also bad with pathos, but they have very good logos. And everybody has its own deficiencies, but Russia has more resources. Just with a calculator. That's why Zaluzhny, in the article from the 1st of November, said if we're going into the war of potentials, we'll lose. And the West just didn't even come to that war. They have lost even before going for the war. And that's it. And now we'll be killing each other by tens of thousands in Avdiivka, Chesov Yar, and for what? What Russia and Ukraine are getting from it? What do we get after wasting 20,000 people dead for two regional centers? In historic sense of things, what did we achieve? In historic sense of things, what did we achieve? We got liked by Brussels and Washington committees who are clapping, watching two monkeys attacking each other with knives. What for, for us? I don't understand what for our soldiers have to die for. So what is it for Putin? I think Putin made the biggest mistake of his life starting this war, and I think he already understands that. Whomever he listened to, this was a complete idiocy from his side to start. And I hope they do understand it now better. And actually, I'm seeing all signs that they do understand that. So it needs to be stopped, and the system needs to be rebuilt, the system of relations. And we can start with Eastern Europe. It's a good place. But continue fighting for regional centers and continue killing our soldiers for supporting the Potsdam-Yalta system when it already doesn't work since 1989. This is a historic crime, in my view. A big historic crime. It probably even metaphysical crime. We shouldn't be fighting this war. Neither Russia nor Ukraine. Okay, Alexei. Stop this war would mean to basically agree to Istanbul terms of Putin's program. Denazification, demilitarization, and out-of-block status. No, no, no. This war cannot be stopped by an old Ukraine or old Russia. Pre-war. Apologies, we have some signal loss. Right, but we are prohibited from thinking as free people in both countries, in Russia and in Ukraine. Just people who can have different opinions on different topics. We have devolved to that level that there is no freedom of speech everywhere, in the United States, in Israel, in Ukraine, in Russia. There is no free speech anywhere. People cannot freely discuss their issues, their real problems. That's why it has to be a different Russia with different strategic goals and different Ukraine with different strategic goals. Then, and only then, everything that I'm talking about will be possible. Because old Ukraine and old Russia will continue fighting in mud and blood and dirt for two more years at least, killing tens of thousands of people and destroying all that. For what? What for? Just answer me a question. Why? And I'm not asking you directly, but anybody of the architects of the current processes, what exactly for? Okay, so how do we stop it if Putin... Do you think he can go for your terms? I think we need to talk to him. We need to have communication, and we need to post a question historically and metaphysically, what for, what is the purpose of Russia, what is the goal of Ukraine, and how do we exist in the future, and how do we coexist?
This is the framework we need to be talking in. We cannot be talking in the old framework. In the new framework, new Ukraine and new Russia can find a solution. And at least, if not go together, to not fight with each other. And to not represent threats for each other. But this is only the beginning, Russia and Ukraine, because the question is much wider. There needs to be a global system. How do we live? And that military solution would not be a default setting, or would not even be a setting. There are other mechanisms that we could use. Arbitrage, negotiations, other things. Just not war. Everybody saw what war is. You want another 10 years of it? The last question. And I'm changing the course here, but I think it has direct relation to what we've been discussing. Last week, I was very impressed by Israel that acknowledged that his soldiers shot and killed, by mistake, three hostages. And nobody in there in Israel prevailed with a different view that, oh, don't do that, because it allows for Hamas propaganda to capitalize on that, that it supports our enemies' views and all. And I have a question. What does it say about people who are fighting like that? If it was Russia or Ukrainian army, do you think they would ever acknowledge that? How is the investigation about Konstantinovka going? I think that says that tells us that Israel will probably continue existing, and I'm not sure about Ukraine. And what about Russia? Oh, Russia, same thing. In the current state, it will not exist. It will either change or will die as well. But I see Russia is somewhat in dynamics. So I think we could not find practical answers to how we strike truce with Russia. No, Yulia, we can. And I think I outlined that, I'll repeat again. We need to agree, new Ukraine and new Russia need to come to agreement that it doesn't make sense to fight. So how do you think Russia would become new? Do you think Putin will change? Well, it does happen in one head. And do you think he needs to get reborn? You know, recently he was convinced by some people to actually give his speech on the backdrop of Ukrainian colors and talk about the brotherly nations. So I think there are some forces behind him and with him that are interested in that solution, but we need to find somebody on the Ukrainian side as well. I don't know, for now I see that he's waiting for Ukraine to fall apart and uh, just look for ways to bite pieces of it, right? Because Ukraine cannot present any person on that high level who will be eligible to discuss that with him. When Zelensky is calling Putin non-human, what are our chances to see them negotiating? They'll be pulling men in these buses, right? Drafting them. And then they'll be going for women. They cancelled it for now, but I'm sure they'll come back to that. And eventually all these uh, draft commissars will be shot at. And that's when the process will end. This whole attempt to create a mono-ethnical country, it doesn't have a long runway. It may run for another month or half a year, but historically it's dead. It's a corpse. And Putin has, or the way he sees, probably two options. Until Ukraine had smartened up, he will continue fighting. When Ukraine becomes wiser, he will sit down and negotiate. Old Ukraine, he will continue pressing. Pressing, pressing, pressing. And it'll be keep running, running and running from the front line until they, it will refuse to fight completely. Or some part will continue fighting, but it will not be enough to hold such a big front line and such a big territory. And that's it. That's the model. He doesn't have anywhere to rush. He is not in a hurry. What else does he look for? He is okay. All right, Alexei, thank you for that. Not a simple conversation. It was a difficult one. I think many of ours are. Well, right, the simple ones you can find on Facebook. The time is difficult, agree. It's the time when we have to review, and it's not just about Russia and Ukraine, when everything we've been thinking about democracy for the last 30 years is being under review. Yulia, I would say last 500 years. It's the end of modern. And we can record a whole separate stream about it. When? Let's do the next one. All right. Perfect. Our next stream will be about the end of modern 
don't know how deep we'll go there, but maybe we can talk about the voting rights and that's I have a point there and I'm afraid it's coming true. Alexei, thank you very much. Good luck.